Good, af- good evening, everybody. I'm absolutely delighted that so many people are keen to come out in the evening to talk about the inequality of wealth. We're going to have a serious and, uh, I think, wide-ranging discussion. Uh, in a moment, I'll introduce uh, Liam. My name's Phil Collins. I'm a columnist on The Times, amongst other things. Uh, and I am, as I was saying to, to Liam before, the leading indicator that polit- the politics of this country are going to change. Because I left the Times, so um, it's the only time in my life I've been decreed to be too left-wing for any institution. And I left the Times because I was regarded as a, a Labour supporter. And then, just recently, they rather cravenly rang me and said, would you please come back? Because we've, we, alone, uh, later than everybody else in the nation, have realised that, in fact, there probably is going to be a change of government and we need a bit of cover. So they didn't quite say it like that, but that's what they meant. Um, And so this is the backdrop to our conversation. We're going to talk with Liam Byrne, a former Chief Secretary of the Treasury uh, in the the last Labour government many, many moons ago, and a serial thinker and writer since, and there aren't too many in the Labour Party of whom that can be said, I think perhaps not enough, Uh, but Liam is certainly one of them. And he spent his lockdown and then many months since refining his thoughts on a central question of political and economic life today, which is inequality. Uh, The data, the arguments, the solutions, insofar as we've got some. And we're going to go through all three of those as we talk. I'm going to leave enough time, I hope, for you to to come in and ask some questions as well. So, Liam, let's start, if we can, by defining what you what is your the problem that's on uh, on display in this book i mean the the inequalities that you're talking about and the and the ways in which they they've been they've worsened over time i remember long ago when you were in the treasury and you were one of the first people i think in this country to recognize a tr- I, I realise now that um, I'll probably be remembered mainly for, uh, for writing short leaving notes at the Treasury. And, you, you know, the truth is that this is the, these are the notes that I wish I'd left because you're right, the, we, we begun to pinpoint the problem that's at the core of this book um, back in about 2009. And there was, there was a little team of us who had gone to go and see um, a guy called Jared Bernstein who was the chief economist to somebody called Joe Biden. And Biden had been running the middle-class task force for Obama for a few years, and he had basically zeroed in on this problem that living... Hang on a minute. I think we've got this problem. And I came, I came back um, the following week, and I said to... Um, to Alistair Darling, God save his soul, um, that we should do something similar. We should set up a middle-class task force to actually look at this problem in, in the UK. And he said, well, look, you know, we're nine months out from an election. There's no way you're doing that. But you, you can go and have a team to, to look at this problem. And sure enough, three months later, we found that in the UK, we'd had this problem of flatlining living standards since about 2005, 2004, 2005. And, and I knew that was going to be a problem. And I suppose that's when we first started looking at it, and we realised that it was going to be really hard mm. to redistribute your way out of that problem. Now, wh- why, you were going to need to change some of the ways the economy is, worked as why well. Why did that happen? Why did it happen in the States and why did it happen here? I mean, it's not like it was perfect before that, but, but that something different happened, didn't it, in the distribution between capital and labour? first in America and then in the UK. So why is it that suddenly the flow changed? So you've got two basic reasons. So one is the way our market runs. So the way that um, our marketplace is organized, the way that we've broken down labor rights over a long period of time. Um, You basically see now these returns to capital going up and up and up and up and up over a long period of time. In fact, that, that problem is so big now that if we had the same kind of returns to labor that we did in, say, the early 70s, that would be worth like a £7,000 pay rise for people. So that is a big problem with the way our marketplace runs. But the second thing is, and, and this is the thing that really drove the book, I suppose, is the way wealth has changed in Britain. So 
you know, since I was born in, in the holy town of Warrington back in 1970, the, the wealth of our country has, has risen a hundredfold. So it's about, it's about 12 trillion pounds now. That's quite hard to visualise. It's, it's enough for about 18 million gold bars, which is also hard to visualise. But mm -hmm. if, it, it's basically enough, if you take the John O'Groats to Land's End test, you can basically pave a path of bullion bars from John O'Groats to, to Land's End. That's, that's how much the wealth of the country is now worth. But overwhelmingly, that money is going to, that wealth is in the hands of people who already have wealth. And they're now accumulating that much faster than before. And it's got a lot worse since 2010. So since 2010, the top 1% have grown their wealth about 31 times faster than everybody else. That's an incredible shift in the pattern of wealth holding in Britain. And of course, trillion pounds worth of quantitative easing is part of that. And so frankly, is a tax rate that's half the level if you get your money from income. So there's lots of different reasons that mean that this kind of inequality that you see today has happened, but it's kind of crept up on us. But and, the, and the property market? I mean, the other asset classes huge. like that, where, we, where we, <clears throat> we tax unduly lightly, yeah. in my view. I mean, that's, that's a, you know, I, I mean, you'll know how, what, what numbers of unmortgaged um, assets we have. I mean, it's yeah. vast, isn't it? Yeah, it's huge. And about... Uh, about 80% of the rise in pension values and property values are down to just keeping interest rates super low. Now, that's great if you own assets. It's really shit if you don't. So at a time when asset values have gone up but wages have stayed low, it's created this terrible problem, in particular for young people, because, you know, again, back in the 70s, the value of assets was about three times national wages. Now it's ten times. So if you don't own assets now frankly, you're screwed because it's going to be incredibly hard for you to be able to afford them. And that creates all kinds of dangers for our politics as well as our economy. Yeah, which we'll come to. Let's, let's break down what we might do about this into, into two halves. Firstly, let's talk about the market conditions because yeah. you talked about how the, the way in which we frame a market matters. The consequences which then ensue in due course will vary depending on the, the type of market we create. So let's talk about players within markets and about policy with, with respect to markets. Then, and then let's come after that onto the redistributive and remedial action that governments can take. So thinking about the type of capitalism uh, we have, and let's start with the, with the, the idea of the firm. Yeah. I mean, in the book, you go through a long, the long history of the idea of the company and the way in which companies act within markets. And, you know, we remind you that you go back to the 1860s, they, they were public limited companies. This was, they were underwritten by public guarantee. So it's not a, it's not a novelty that the public should have some interest in the, in the actions of the private firm. So what, just take us through where you think we are in that argument now. I spend my days talking to companies who are all over the idea of their purpose, and they pay at least lip service to the notion that a company is more than a private vehicle for the enhancement of shareholder value. But do they live up to that? So, so they just don't. But you, you're right to go back to the history because um, if, if you read the debates, as, as, as I have, on the Limited Liability Act, so the Limited Liability Act comes in 1855 to hike the Crimean, Crimean War. And, and Palmerston uh, drives it through because he says this is going to be to the general advantage of the public. And so what, what this basically does is it means that Parliament no longer has to set up every company. You can now set up your own companies. It allows people to put their little pots of capital together. Um, but it means you can't sue the people who run the company if the thing goes bust. Um, and we've completely <laughs> lost sight of the original intention, which was that we were supposed mm. to be doing this for the common good. Yeah. And you now look at the Ad way Adam that Smith was opposed to it on exactly he, those exactly. grounds, wasn't he? And yeah, exactly. Did you, did you come across the musical that Gilbert and Sullivan wrote about that, the um, 1863 um, Limited Liabilities Act? I didn't. <laughs> I mean, you could, have, you could have written a musical instead of this long book. <laughs> I would have been more it's, called, it's called Utopia we could have, Limited. We could have sung it to you. Utopia Limited, it's fantastic. Yeah, but what you've, what you've now got is, I mean, some of you will have seen the news last week that I think by about the 3rd of January, 4th of January, chief executives were paid as much as most workers would earn in, in a year. So you've got executive pay really now beginning to rocket. You've got huge amounts of money now going into share buybacks. You've got huge amounts of money going into dividends. And the way we set our market up is all about profit maximization in the short term. 
And not every economy is like that. You look at the German economy, you look at other European economies. A lot of them are programmed very differently. So there are things that we can do to rewrite the rules of our marketplace that could encourage people to take a much more longer-term view of things. I'm, I'm very struck by that, by the, the different outcomes of different types of capitalism. And I want you to just say a bit more about that. Because I remember a while ago writing on this myself and, and being quite shocked to discover that the federal government of the United States does more work to redistribute income yeah. than the government of Sweden. Yeah. It's just that the outcome of Swedish capitalism is relatively equal, yeah. whereas the outcome of American capitalism is savagely unequal. Yeah. And so it's, it's actually the underlying market relations which are more important than the government. That's exactly right. And so the, the, the irony is, is that if you look at um, where these companies get their money from, so together, anybody who is saving into a pension has put aside in the UK about two trillion pounds worth of pension savings. But right now, we as pension savers have got no way of checking whether we're investing in companies that are screwing their workers or poisoning the planet or dodging their taxes. Yet when we did polling for the book, we said, look, do you, would you switch pension provider if you thought they were behaving unethically? Three quarters of people said they would switch pension provider if they thought the pension, was invest the pension company was investing in bad capitalism, if you like, rather than good capitalism. So, you know, there's a bunch of changes that we can make to roll up the crazy number of funds we've got, make it much clearer as to what you're investing in, and then actually change the way boardrooms work to put people with a long-term interest in the boardroom, like workers, like creditors, like suppliers. And this is a very different kind of structure that would encourage people, I think, to invest for the longer term. And that isn't capitalism that's woke, that's just capitalism that works but it would have a big impact on inequality in the long term. I mean, there's lots of gatherings of chief execs who've made a similar case, isn't yeah. there? This is not... This is not, this, some, this is not Marxism. No, anyway. it's not you a know. cry from the, from no. the far left at all, no. is it? This is, uh, you know, the, the, lots of the, the Aspen uh, principles, for example, and, uh, um, you know, and, and, um, and Fink, et cetera, BlackRock. Exactly. I mean, these, these are, in a sense, they're quite mainstream points, and yet they're a million miles from where we are. Yeah. No, I think that's right. You've, you've had, you know, these um, great kind of American corporate leaders for about, what, 10 years now, who are basically saying that boardrooms are broken, we do need to be starting to invest in companies that have a purpose rather than not having a purpose, mm. um, we need to be taking a longer term view of things. But, you know, right now, we don't have politicians kind of saying, look, in the scheme of things, this is really important. And if we don't rewrite the rules for the way our but could they not just work, do it? Yeah, they could. I mean, they, they literally and could, they and they not? would have business support for it yeah. as well. That's the, the, the real kind of tragedy of our politics today. You would get the CBI backing a lot of this. Mm. You would get the Federation of Small Business backing a lot of this, but and Black it would be popular. But if BlackRock really wanted to, to invest in things for the long term and, and, and to have stipulations about the way in which that, the, the companies made their money, they, they, they're free to do so. What's yeah. stopping them? Well, in, in their case, a lot of their money is now in, in just kind of tracker funds, and we lack these activist investors that are big enough. So in the UK, you've got this crazy number of 32,000 different pension funds. If you look at countries like Canada or Australia, they've rolled them up into kind of a handful, four or five or six super funds that can actually get much more involved in the way that a company is run for the long term. And so you know, we are going to have to kind of make some changes to the way the investment market works. And you've got to couple that with changes that the way boardrooms work if you're going to bend the trend yeah. in a better direction for the future. Are you optimistic about the, <laughs> the way in which, you know, companies, think about the, you know, companies, you know, large and small. Are you optimistic about the, the power of, of ethical imperatives, the, the desire of people who are running companies to do the right thing and therefore make a change? Or do you think, actually, in the end, there's a role for government here and we're going to have to force you? So I think def a government definitely has got a role. I'm, I am actually perhaps naively optimistic about companies beginning to head in this direction because companies know that if they're going to hire the best talent in the future, actually, they're going to have to embrace people who don't want to work in companies that want to destroy the planet, dodge taxes, mm -hmm. screw workers. So I think there is a generational trend underway now. I think new generations coming into uh, the workplace now are going to have a huge impact on the DNA of companies. 
because it's the only way that good companies can hire good people in the future. But it's not going to... I'm naive about Well, that, it's not going to alter that balance between capital and labour, is it? Let's, let's imagine I'm running a company and I listen to you yeah. and, I, and I then you know, invest into my company for the long term and I become more successful as a result of articulating my purpose. Well, all the better for me as the holder of capital because I, that, that balance is all in my favour and I get even more... Um, wealthy with respect to you, the worker. Yeah. Without some rebalancing of those long-term effects of policy that you started with, that's going to make things worse, isn't it, rather than better? But I think we've got to remember that the person who is a worker is also a saver as well as a citizen. So I absolutely do think you're going to have to make some changes to company law. You're definitely going to have to change the way our investment market works to roll it up. But I kind of think you'll be pushing with the grain in the future, in the years to come. Because I think actually a lot of the leaders of many of these companies know that the only way they're going to hire the best talent in the future is if they're kind of behaving differently to, to the past. Mm. Uh, do, I mean, let, let's talk a bit, a bit about climate change, which is, you know, a, you know, will bring with it inequalities like you've never seen. Yeah. Um, and there's a strong push from some companies to say, we don't need more regulation, we, we, we've got this. Yeah. Um, and it's notable what's happening in, in America. You, know, you had a, a government for a time that, that was you know, absolutely antediluvian on yeah. climate change, and yet corporate America didn't really follow that path. But again, is it naive to think that that's going to be enough? You know, everyone having a net zero policy, and is that going to add up to anything? I, it's definitely not going to add up to enough. And so you're, you're definitely going to have to create you know, some of those targets, some of those changes to the law, but you're also going to have to find ways of empowering savers who are putting their money into those companies. So, you know, one of the big changes that you see in investors right now is that investors are saying, well, look, you're not behaving in a way that's compatible with the Paris Climate Change Agreement. We're going to sort of move our investment money somewhere else, thanks very much. Or if they are involved and they're an active investor, they're getting involved in those kind of decisions. But... You know, one of the things that really struck me writing the book is that you've got these kind of agreements for Paris and we've got to try and hold temperatures down to below 2C. We haven't got a similar framework for tackling inequality, mm. even though we know rising inequality is a systemic risk. You know, the IMF, the World Bank, the OECD, they're all now really clear. Countries that are less equal grow more slowly. So there is a systemic risk from high levels of inequality. And so trying to find a way of creating some of those investment frameworks is going to be really important for the future. Can, can you just explain to us how that mechanism works? How is it, why is it the case that a country which is more unequal grows more slowly? So, th th so there's basically two reasons. So the, the first is that countries that are very unequal are much more prone to booms and busts. So uh, we're a good example of that, frankly, in 2008, 2009. Um, but the, you know, the other big reason is that if you've got increasing amounts of money in the hands of the very rich... Actually, they don't, save, they don't spend it. They tend to save it. So you actually damage the kind of consumption function of your economy as well. So your uh, unequal economies become a lot choppier uh, because they're more prone to boom and bust. But, but second, you, know, you just don't have the force of consumer spending either. So you, you've got two sort of quite big effects that okay, slow well, down growth. One of the obvious reasons why that's the case in the, in the, in the UK, and you, you were there at the sharp end of this, um, and is the existence of a very, very large financial services yeah. sector. And that clearly contributes to inequality in itself, and it's, it's the financing of, of the capitalism that we have. And lots of countries which are much more equal just simply don't have that kind of uh, sector. And you might say that the new Labour years were in large part financed by the revenues that derive from the City of London, and then when it all crashed, as you know better than anyone, there was no money left. Yeah. And that's a significant problem we've got, isn't it? The city. I think, it, I mean, it's still a big factor. I mean, it's still 25% of the profits that are earned in Britain are earned in the financial services sector. So it's still, it's still enormous. And therefore, if you were to lose it, if you like, the country as a whole is going to be a hell of a lot poorer. But for a long time now, this was a, a lesson I think that Labour woke up to much too late in, in our time in office, you know, we were not thinking about how you rebalance the economy geographically or sectorally. And so, you know, we did end up with this over-reliance on the city. And frankly, that problem has 
has just not changed in the last 10 to 15 years. If any, it's got, you know, I'm not saying it's a lot worse, but it's, it's just not improved. Um, and Brexit, dare I say Brexit, um, has obviously not helped it either. Well, I was going to ask you about Brexit. It used to be the rule that no meeting could, was allowed to pass without a long <laughs> yeah. mention of Brexit. I mean, we're not quite there now, but, but obviously it's pertinent to us, you know, as yeah. the, the major event that's happened in the last decade affecting the economic health of the nation. Um, I, I did wonder, once upon a time, in a slightly sort of gallows humour way, whether Brexit in shattering our financial services industry might yeah. in fact do some wonders for our yeah. levels of inequality. It doesn't appear to have done that. No. What, what do you think are the effects of Brexit with respect to this argument about the inequalities in Britain? Well, the, the, the effect of Brexit is to basically make most people poorer. So if you think about the ABC of British politics for the last 13 years, austerity, Brexit, COVID, what, what, what is remarkable about that 13 years' worth of pain when it comes to kind of living standards is that most people have had a really shit time. But oddly enough, the top 1% have just got richer and richer and richer. So... In a, in a way, Brexit is one of those shocks that has kind of held back the growth of wealth and living standards for most people, but it's just meant that those who are luckiest, those at the top, have just pulled further and further away. Because, of course, one of the things we try to do to, to help, you know, give CPR to the economy is put nearly a trillion quid's worth of quantitative easing into the system. And that's kept interest rates low and it's kept employment high, but it's also meant that if, if you're lucky enough to have assets you've just had this spectacular wealth boom for the last 13 years. Yeah. I mean, one of your early chapters in the book is all about the super rich, and you go into this in yes. some, some detail. And I wondered if you'd explain to us why, why the super rich matter so much. Why is it not the case that it might be unedifying to have the super rich, yeah. but why do they... Is it inconceivable that we could have a super rich class somewhat detached from the rest of the society, but then the rest of us were relatively equal? Or is there a causal factor in having a super rich yeah. thing, which is more than your moral disapproval of them? Yeah. It's something that work, that has a systemic effect through society. Yeah. So, so this th th this puzzled me a lot. And you know, being a, a good you know New Labour boy when mm -hmm. I came into politics, um, we were all about aspiration and opportunity. And um, I think one of our number once said, you know, I don't mind the filthy rich as long as they they pay their taxes. And you know, I thought about this a lot. And, and the problem, of course is that those who become very wealthy, it's not, you know, many people will find what I call the absurdity of affluence distasteful, you know, the, the super yachts and the private jets and the Rolls Royces, the conspicuous consumption, that's, you know, a bit distasteful, but it's the inconspicuous consumption of influence and power that should really trouble us. And that, you know, I have to say is what I've seen change a hell of a lot since I've been in the House of Commons. I've been in, in the Commons nearly 20 years now. And the presence of big money in politics is now like nothing I've ever seen before. And so what you do see in every economy where you have huge levels of inequality is the super rich cannot stop themselves getting involved in politics and backing parties and policies that basically minimise what they pay into the system. And there's all kinds of reasons for that. You know, there is quite a lot of new um, brain psychology, which I talk about in the book. But it's just that it's... You, you can't get away from the political economy of this, which is those who have assets get involved in politics to protect those assets, and that damages the redistribution in most economies. I don't know if in the, in the course of your reading of this book you read Fukuyama's famous book, The End yeah. of History. In the preface to The End of History, Fukuyama writes about the way that American capitalism gives enough glory to certain people that they don't therefore have to go into politics. And the example he cites back in 1998 is Donald Trump. Yeah. <laughs> sadly, that. sadly, it wasn't enough for Donald Trump. But, but, the, but the book is... Um, the, the book is, is prescient in a way, isn't it? Because yeah. what, what Fukuyama kind of begins to take aim at is how trust dissolves when you've got high levels of inequality. And when you've got trust dissolving in a market economy, people, people can't trade anymore because actually they just don't trust you not to kind of screw them yeah, over. Yeah, exactly. So in fact, the title of his book that followed that is indeed Trust. Yeah. And was exactly that point. Um, you raised something which intrigues me about inequality, which is that... In lo lots, there's lots of polling that shows that 
the general public, as a rule, distinguish between yeah. rich people of different types. And the, the broad distinction is that between someone who they regard as having earned what they did through entrepreneurial yeah. risk, through imagination, through innovation, and on the other hand, somebody who hasn't really earned it because they're just uh, a gilded employee in an era in which you can become fabulously wealthy by merely working for a firm. And there's a, do you draw a distinction at all between somebody who in sense you think has earned it yeah. or someone who you think hasn't? Yeah, Def definitely. And so the, the, the book before this was um, Dragons, which is about 10 entrepreneurs who made British history over the last 800 years. So there are definitely good and, and bad. And, and good entrepreneurs are people who create new things, they create value, they advance, you know, our civilization in all sorts of ways. Bad entrepreneurs are what you call rent seekers. So basically, they're not creating value for anybody. They're just charging you to use something. So the classic example is the robber baron who owns a river and decides to put a chain across the river, and you now have to pay to get up the river to the market you know, to sell your goods. He, the robber baron's not created any value. He's just extracted value from you. And what you see in our economy today is you see sectors where rent seeking is a problem are now nearly half of UK profits. So rent seeking has just now exploded as a big problem. So that's one big issue. Financial services become an issue because what behavioral economics now tells us is that they are prone to booms and busts. There isn't such a thing as an efficient market. Mm -hmm. Things do tend to go haywire every so on because we're kind of human. And so we don't, we don't have a kind of a new Keynes that has given us a kind of a new general theory of capitalism since the financial crisis. But you have got the new institutional economists, the neo Schumpeterians, the behavioral economics folks, together, they kind of tell you what I call reality economics, mm -hmm. means that things go wrong as well as right. So you can't just put markets everywhere and hope for the best. Actually, that kind of approach to market supremacy is going to create problems for okay. you. So your objection to the super rich and to then to, by extension, to inequality is, is not just the sheer numbers. It's also the process by which it came about. So you've got, what, you've got a justice problem. So can you justify particular individuals getting a windfall that really they've not done much to earn just because they happen to own assets at a time we kept interest rates low? But second, it has consequences for the wealth that's enjoyed by everybody else because they engage in uh, behavior that leads to boom and bust cycles. Um, they run companies in a bad way, and crucially, they get involved inevitably in politics in a way to safeguard their own interests rather than help build a wealth-owning democracy. And there are some assets like educational goods which are limited and they can yeah. buy more of them to, to the advantage exactly. of their and, and families so you, and so you, on. You do see this pattern across all economies that have got high levels of, un, uh, of inequality. Social mobility tends to break down because... You, you, can't, you can't forget that wealth inequality has got this generational dimension. So the privileges of, the, of one generation, they do get handed down. And you know, Robert Putnam's written a brilliant book um, recently called, I think it's called Our Kids, where he's beginning to examine what this is like in his hometown. And he can see now this incredible kind of separation of rich and poor. But what's happening amongst poorer communities or non-rich communities is that social mobility just collapses. Mm -hmm. And you know, when we poll on this, people have got a sense of this now. So people now think that the way to get on in life is not to work hard. People now think the way to get on in life is to be born into a wealthy family or to have good networks. Hard work actually comes fourth on the list of factors that people now think mean that you get on in life. That's an extraordinary mm -hmm. state of affairs now, I think. Let me put the, the sort of centre-right critique to yeah. you of your, your position, which is to say that, no, you, you've, you, isn't, you, you've misstated it. It's not inequality that is really the problem here that you're really objecting to. It's, in fact, poverty. And if we could raise the floor, mm. then even if in, the inequality, i.e. the gap between the bottom and the top, remained constant, mm. we'd have done something really good and we'd have fixed the problem that you're really bothered about. Mm. And you're misstating it, say, inequality, because it doesn't matter that you're incredibly rich and I'm, I'm not so rich, as long as I'm pretty rich. Mm. And that, therefore, your stress on inequality is the wrong word. Mm. No, and, and that is you know, a defensible argument, but the problem is it ignores the consequences of what happens in unequal societies. So 
when you look across the whole universe of unequal societies, you see three things. You see societies that become corrupt. You see societies that become poorer because people will stop paying their dues into um, the common pot. And they become stagnant. Social mobility begins to break down. So even if you don't care about the injustice of inequality, just in, in pure outcome terms, if you want to avoid countries that become corrupt, poor and stagnant, you should care about inequality. Let, let's move on to some of the things we might do yeah. at the level of, of, of government. Um, we may well be on the verge of a, of a, a new government in, in due course, uh, one which will care about this. I mean, the previous government has had a whole department designed to demonstrate that they're meant to care, even, even they, they didn't. An interesting name it was given, too, levelling up, yeah. which in a way is a, the critique I've just offered yeah. you, isn't it? It's to say that you level down, we level up. Um, so there'll, there'll certainly be a, a government, um, if, if there's a change, that, that, that cares about these, these questions. What, where do we start, then, with thinking... <laughs> l let's just imagine, yeah. for the purpose of this thought experiment, that the the changes in the marketplace are beginning. Yeah. So we're, yeah. not, we're not waiting everything on, on a reforming government. But what can and should a reforming government do to enable this problem to be ameliorated? So, so, so the framework I come to is, is actually um, a framework that was developed by James Mead. So James, James Mead, for those who don't know James Mead, he was a disciple of Keynes. He invented national income accounts. He did a lot to put Keynes' idea actually into practice. And Mead basically recognises that if you care about wealth inequality, you need to care about four or five things. You've got to care about growth. You've got to care about earnings. You've got to care about savings. You've got to care about the returns that people get on those savings. And you've got to care about tax. And so I basically use that list to say, right, what could you do in the UK? Let's not, let's not do anything mad. Let, let's, let's use ideas that have been tested somewhere around the world. And actually, you can come up with a pretty plausible list. So... We know that innovate, you know, innovative economies grow faster. We don't invest as much in innovation as others. We're a very centralised economy. We should be devolving quite radically. That would actually help with growth. We could harness the power of investment uh, of pension savers and their £2 trillion to encourage firms to go more long-term. We could put workers on boards, create a more long-term culture in the boardrooms. So those two things would do good things for wages, I think. There's then this interesting question about what you do about savings. And... One of the shocking, the most, the things that shocked me most researching the book was a quarter of people in our country have net savings of less than £100. I mean, it's, you know, it, it is, it, it's awful. And lots of people have said universal basic income is one of the answers. I have a different take. I mean, I think the answer is actually not universal basic income, but universal basic capital. So creating, um, a bit like your auto-enrolment pension, opening universal savings accounts would be one of the ways in which you could start... Um, rebalancing £65 billion pounds worth of tax incentives for those who have savings, you can actually begin helping people build their savings up faster. But one of the most important bits of capital I think you can ever come to in life is your, is your house. Mm. And obviously, you know, house prices are now so high that um, no matter how long young people save, they're going to struggle to get on the housing ladder. So there's an idea that a couple of think tanks have come out with, which is about <coughs> giving young people a, a, about a £10,000 um, deposit dividend by the age of 25 to help them accelerate their home ownership. You could pay for that by creating a sovereign wealth fund, and you could actually build that sovereign wealth fund a hell of a lot faster if you restore fairness to the tax system. It is mad that Rishi Sunak, on £2 million a year, pays tax of 21% when one in five people are paying 40% tax. And there's a whole way in which you can do that, but... What, what was quite interesting is that you can come up with sort of quite plausible answers on all five of the Jay's Mee's points. And these aren't novel ideas that are untested. They're all ideas that have worked somewhere. If you put them together, they could actually bend the trend for the future. As I read through the, the list yeah. from, from Mead, and you go through them, and they're very good, and, and I felt that you, I didn't encounter too many political objections most of the way down. Yeah. Most of the way through, as you did in the answer there, I thought, well, I can go with you politically. I don't, when I say I, I meant, I meant the nation. I could see uh, a politician going out to make a case for this without 
too great a political problem. When you get to tax, yeah. it bites, doesn't it? It? Does. it really starts to bite. And I want to talk about that, yeah. about, about the, the, which is the politics is. of this. Because even if we all agree, this is the perfect prescription for the nation. I'm sure we all will. What, we want, what we'll have to do, of course, is to get that through a democratic election. Yeah. And it bites with tax. Now, property is the first place yeah. it, it bites, doesn't it? Now, why on earth is it just that somebody like me, who just happened to be generationally fortunate enough to buy a house, I had no inheritance, but I was generationally lucky to, in the right place at the right time, my house has probably earned more than I have. Hmm. It's ridiculous, isn't it? There's no sense in which I've earned that money. That ought to be taxed as an unearned benefit to me, surely. And yet I pity the poor politicians who are going to go out there and <laughs> offer that <laughs> as an electoral uh, yeah, but actually, what, what, one, one way of approaching that is to say, in, instead of um, paying, you know, the way that we do council tax, for example, you could say, well, look, if you had, you know, a half a percent of the value of that um, paid as your kind of council tax contribution, that would probably mean that you paid more council tax. But actually, it would it would end one of the most regressive tactics that yeah. we have in this country. And obviously, you couldn't do it overnight. You'd need to kind of phase it in and make sure that there are protections for people who couldn't pay and that kind of thing. Um, but that is absolutely something you could do. But, you know, well, non the council, the council tax is a very good example, isn't yeah. it, of how difficult council this tax is. is brilliant Because we've not revalued it since, since 1991. Since John Major. Yeah. yeah. And um, I, mean, I remember being in, in Downing Street when Michael Lyons did a review of it, a very sensible review, entirely economically rational, political madness. I mean, yeah. completely and utterly shelved it. And it, it's an absurd set of misvaluations of, of property, isn't it? And, and I remember calculating at the time of the 2010 election, if you had simply revalued council tax, that would be more or less equivalent to the mansion tax that the Labour Party was then suggesting yeah. they put on, on domestic residences. But, and yet but, it's but, so hard to... Do, to but, but you can do things on council tax that don't necessarily raise new money, but do make the current thing fairer. I think, ultimately, and this is where the Wealth Tax Commission really did some work for the, for the nation, is you are going to have to kind of look at where different kinds of money comes from. So non-DOMS is well rehearsed. It's about $3.8 billion. Um, if you're as radical as, say, Nigel Lawson, and you equalise tax on investment income um, and regular income, you know, that's about another 9 to £10 billion. Pounds. Charging national insurance contributions on investment income about another nine to ten billion, you know, you're quite quickly getting into you know billion here, billion there, soon it's serious money, you know, and that's before you get into some of the more radical ideas like a, a one percent tax on the twenty two thousand estates that are worth over ten million. That brings you in about another eleven billion. So you know, the, the, these are quite big sort of chunks of money. Now, I wouldn't recommend any opposition try and do this work in opposition because. You need to understand who the losers are and it all, you know, automatically becomes a defining issue at an election. But investment income in Britain since 2000 has doubled. Mm. It's now £80 billion pounds a year. 60% of that money goes to the top 10%, and they pay a rate of tax on it that's half the top rate of tax. Is that mm. fair? It's hard to see how that's fair. And I think, therefore, you've got to take the public on a journey, which is, look, it's wrong that Rishi Sunak, as Prime Minister, earns £2 million a year, pays 21% tax, when one in five people pay 40% tax. Mm -hmm. And I put this question to him, and he kind of just said to me, well, it's fine, because this was the system introduced by Gordon Brown. <laughs> you know, so mm -hmm. Ignoring any of the changes that, have been, uh, that we've seen in our economy in the last 10 to 13 years. But, you know, nonetheless, you, you know, a, a, this is a big decision. And so you would need to take people on a journey, and crucially you'd need to persuade people that government wasn't going to waste the money, that they were going to spend the money well. And that's why, you know, radical proposal, this is the radical proposal, I sort of say, well, look, if you put that money into rebuilding a sovereign wealth fund that gave young people a deposit to help them get a house, actually, most people could get on board with that, mm. I think. Let's just take w w one final tax, because one of the transfer mechanisms for the entrenched and consolidated inequality, of course, is it's passed down through the generations. Yeah. And, you know, my unearned income, I, I, mean, I don't want to give anyone the impression I'm part of your super rich, because I'm not. But nonetheless, I, can, I will pass on more to my children than, than, than most people can. They've done nothing to merit that, nothing whatsoever. Mm. And yet you try and suggest that 
we increase our inheritance tax by so much as a penny, and my God, the furies are upon you. Yeah. So how do we then prevent that perfectly natural desire to hand down things to our children, which is nevertheless cascading inequality and power through generations? So this is a really, really big point. And I suppose this, this was the thing that frightened me most about writing the book, because you know, I, I can see now how wealth inequality is driving all kinds of crazy political behaviour. And Ben Ansell, who some of you will have heard, did the Reith Lectures this year, a lot of his work shows that where you've got big wealth inequality, you get people voting for populists. That's true for Brexit voters, it's true for Le Pen voters, Trump voters, Scandinavian far right. But think about what's about to happen. Nothing's forever, including the baby boomers. As they shuffle off this mortal coil, they're going to bequeath five and a half trillion pounds to the next generation. Now, some will inherit fortunes, but others are going to inherit care bills. Mm. So the inequality that we have got today, it is about to be utterly transformed. And so Gen Z is about to become the most unequal generation, I don't know, for half a century. So if we think wealth inequality creates problems today, it is as nothing compared to what is about to hit us. And that's why I kind of say, look, I think we're at a fork in the road now in Britain. If we don't start taking action now to fix wealth inequality today, you can kiss goodbye to any measure of equality this century. And that has big implications for our freedom, because ultimately, freedom is built on security, and security is built on wealth. So if we genuinely want to live in a free country for the future, we're going to need to think about how we build a wealth-owning democracy. So are you saying that the upshot of all your other actions would mean you can avoid the troubling question of inheritance tax? No, but I think if you look at what most OECD countries have done, they've actually got rid of inheritance tax and created a gift tax instead. So you basically pay tax on significant gifts that you get. Because you remember that sort of furore when it was revealed the king wasn't going to pay inheritance tax? Well, he would have been the exception, frankly, if he had. Because once you get inheritances over a couple of million, the rate of incidence of the tax collapses because, of course, everybody's figured out how yeah, to avoid as it. Someone who's, someone who's handing over the money, I've seen, I see what you've done there. You've just rebadged it. Now, does that alter the politics of it by, by creating a, a gift tax rather than only bequest tax? I, I, I think it could. Obviously, it depends where you set the levels. But, I mean, if you've got people who are going to... Are asking people to pay a bit of tax on gifts that they get of, I don't know, over half a million quid... That doesn't sort of seem kind of unreasonable to me. And I think, uh, funnily enough, I think it might be easier to sell people on that than on what some of the ideas that I hear knocking around the Conservative Party. Mm. It's just it's an incredibly toxic tax politically, isn't it? You know, and you remember, you'll remember George Osborne's um, yeah. kind of stymieing the general election that might have kept you in the Treasury for longer. <laughs> uh, and your note would never have been an issue never been a thing. were it not for inheritance tax. And Os Osborne yeah. understood the political impact of that tax and it's and it's an idea i mean uh, let me put the case briefly i mean, i don't buy it but the, but i understand it yeah. the case is well i've earned this money i've brought, i've got this um sort of you know pot and i and i've reared my children partly incentivized by the desire to hand on what i have to my family and that's what i want to do and i don't take kindly to you the representative of the state coming in and yeah. having it for all your fancy ideas in your book yeah. that's my money and now it's my children's money yeah. And it's a very powerful force. And, it, and it's a huge issue because you, we've got five and a half trillion quid about to transfer down the generation. So we are going to have to kind of figure this out. Um, but the, the, the question is, you know, do you, do you bequeath your children a country that is so divided that it's a place that, frankly, isn't terribly pleasant to live in? But that's why I think having an intelligent conversation about where you set those kind of levels because, you know, the, the debate on... The deal on tax in Britain was always... Um, you know, that you basically, you, you tax the living and you avoid taxing the dead. But actually making sure that the gifts that you get are taxed at a sensible level so that actually you can pass on the fruits of your hard labour to a large extent, I think you can get a level there that works. Do you think... But that's going to be several years' worth of debate and it's going to take politicians who are kind of brave enough to kind of wade into this territory. And where, who are those people? Because that's... 
it's a. Well, mean, it looks like it's me and you. It's me and you, isn't it? <laughs> and you know, and, and, f and for all our potency and for all the excellence of this audience, I don't think there's enough. Um, because you do wonder well, who. We'll sign them up at the back. You do wonder who will have the courage to do this, yeah. don't you? Because it's it is. I mean, you know, from being in politics, it's a very difficult thing to do whilst you're in charge yeah. of something. It's really hard argument to run, and yet as you make a very good case that it's absolutely imperative. That we do yeah, so. although I would say that there are other taxes that we need to fix first. So, I mean, I think non-DOMs, that is pretty obvious. What was quite surprising in the polling that we did for the book was there's something like 60% support, you know, for a 1% tax on the fortunes over and above 10 million. And actually, the, that support level doesn't go down amongst conservative voters very much. So I, I, was, I was actually taken aback about how much support there is for some wealth taxes, um, and that doesn't, that doesn't come across in the public debate. So it, doing what Nigel Lawson did, mm. that seems something that you could win an argument for. National insurance on investment income, I think you could probably win the argument for that. Do you think there's any mileage in the old liberal argument, the 1911 argument, mm. uh, that, that, that really radical budget be between, I've mentioned it before, between earned income on the one hand and unearned on the other? I, d I do, yeah, because... If you've, if you've just put, right, a trillion pounds of quantitative easing into the economy and you've handed this whacking great windfall to people who are just lucky enough to own assets, actually asking people to pay a bit back on the investment income doesn't sort of seem unreasonable, especially if those individuals are paying half the rate of tax of everybody else. So I, I do think that that's, and, you know, some of the polling bears this out that we've got in the book, I do think that's an argument you can have. And, you know, we can't make progress on this unless we have some big debates about mm. tax. But, you know, the, the, the question, I guess, the, there'll be people who disagree with this analysis, but the question I've got for them is, okay, tell me where I'm wrong, but you need to tell me a better solution for how Gen Z or millennials are going to get a foot on the housing ladder. Because yeah. right now I can't say, you can't build your way out of this problem. You could build hundreds and thousands of homes a year. It wouldn't actually move... The, the numbers a lot because right now only four percent of people who don't own a home have got both the deposit and the earnings to get a mortgage four percent mm. so unless you make unless you kind of change your ability to actually buy a house you're not really going to move the needle mm. in a significant way. throughout the book you get this very strong sense of the movement between the generations. It reminded me in a funny way of the, the book David Willits wrote a few years ago, The yeah. Pinch, in which he's talking about the effects that large generational cohorts can have. And that's what we're happening here. And we've had this enormous generation which has gathered all the assets in, unto itself and is now about to transfer them down. And we're trying to live with the policy for generational passing on. Yeah. Once upon a time, that was the very epitome of conservative political thought. Those great yeah. passages from Burke about the, the, the generations. Exactly. And yet they've, they've been completely and utterly blind yeah. to this, haven't they? Yeah, you don't... I mean, there's a lovely interview with David in, in, in the book, and I kind of ask him why he wrote Pinch and, and what took him to it. And it was him beginning to worry about how on earth his kids were going to get a foot on the, on the housing ladder. Um, and he, like me, kind of shares this view that, that the economy has now changed so fundamentally because when you've got the... The, the price of assets at 10 times what the nation earns each year, how the hell are those without assets ever going to be able to afford a house they want, an education, a pension for the future? They're not. And so we've got to now start thinking generationally because we're at that point now where the baby boomers are passing on significant amounts of wealth, where we have had, what, a decade and a bit of flatline living standards, and yet those at the very top of society are doing better and better and better. The more you talk, the more I think your famous note should have read, there's loads of money there. <laughs> it's just all in the wrong places. Um, just before I turn it over to questions for, from the audience, can, are, are you optimistic? Can you give us a, a, a note of yeah, optimism? No, to, I'm, to I'm really end? optimistic. I, I know I've led you into sort of pessimistic analysis. No, but, no, no, no. But tell us how it's and, all going to get and better. The, um, and the book is written as a council of hope, actually, rather than despair, because... You know, right now, there is a lot of pessimism. There's a lot of declinism. There's a lot of sense that, you know, things are impossible and things are never going to get better. Actually, what the book shows is that progress is perfectly possible if we embrace a few common sense ideas. None of this is really novel. These are ideas that have been tried and tested somewhere. 
are they, you know, could you do them overnight? No. Could you do it over the course of three terms of a new government? Absolutely. But it does require us to now get quite serious about how we're going to change and how we're going to fairly share the future. Let me come to you. Let me, let's have some questions. Um, just anything, I'll take a, a few. Yes, the, you're very quick there. Very excellent. I can uh, There's a microphone coming to you. If you just tell us who you are and, the, and then your question. Thank yes, you. Yes, awesome. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Lily Walker. I work at Centrepoint, a youth homelessness charity, as head of policy, research and campaigns, which leads into my question. So at Centrepoint, we found that the cost of youth homelessness annually is £8.5 billion. We also found that last year, 136,000 young people were facing homelessness and that if with no intervention, that's likely to, to double over the course of the next five years. When we went to party conference season, at the Conservatives, we did not get a look in. At the Labour Party, um, we got a look in, and then the sense was, but, you know, fiscal responsibility, can't commit to anything. And so in an election year, I suppose my question is, how likely do you think we are to see commitments to closing that generational gap and hearing that figure of $8.5 billion and actually doing something about it? Why don't you take that, Liam, whilst everyone yeah, else sure. gathers out um, nasty questions for so you? <laughs> so, I mean, I'm not hugely opti optimistic that we'll see too many of um, the expensive policies this side of an, an election because it's going to be quite a nasty election and people are really going to trade on the what I call the politics of loss aversion, which is... You know, the Conservatives in particular will, you know, really kind of shroud wave, I think, about issues like tax. I think you're going to see a lot more of my note, I'm afraid, over the course of this year as it's used as a kind of a political tactic. Um, but I am more optimistic about what happens thereafter for this reason. If you look back, it's really odd, this, you know, if you look back at the big change manifestos in British politics, so 1945... 1964, 1979, 1997. Each of those manifestos only uses the word radical once. They are often quite short documents, and they explain their argument as a kind of a return to common sense. They kind of explain a, a change of direction. And I think that's what you're going to see in the manifestos this year. You will have people kind of say, look, this is the right direction or this is the wrong direction, and it will be that kind of rhetoric that you see. What you, what you then notice in British politics is that it's the second and third manifesto of a, uh, of a reforming government that really does get quite bold. And in a way, that's why I'm writing the book and publishing the book and arguing for the book now, because the truth is, unless you get stuck into this kind of work in your first term, you will never have that second or third manifesto ready. So this is you know, unashamedly a kind of an ambitious manifesto for a three-term government, written safe in the knowledge that, that the manifestos that we see this year may be you know, a little bit disappointing, a little bit timid, may couch their arguments in terms of a change of direction. So it's, it's supremely important that people like you, people like the, your organisation, are really, really deeply involved in this argument now. And I also chair a group called the All Party Group on Inclusive Growth, which is a cross-party group on inclusive growth um, that is trying to find a lot of the cross-party consensus in some of the arguments that you've made, for example. Because if you can find a cross-party consensus, you've got a better guarantee that ideas will be sustainable for the long term. You won't have a situation where one party legislates for it and then the next lot come in and they unwind it all and you know, you're back to kind of square one. So... Um, the, so I wouldn't kind of stake everything, if you like, on the manifestos that you see this year because actually it's, it's the work of the next government that you've really got to influence when they're in power, when they're in office, when they've got the levers of power available to them. Let's have Thank some you. more questions. So there's a hand at the back. I, I know it's attached to someone, but I can't see who it's attached to from here. Yes, sir. Hello, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is John. I'm, I'm wondering what your views are with respect to artificial intelligence, AI, because yes. I tend to think it's going to make things enormously worse than they are already and just um, yeah. accelerate the trends that I'm really opposed to. That, there's a very good question that I should have asked. Uh, let's, let's take a couple more. No, end up coming. Yes, the lady there, and then we've got another one here. more, 
And when people consume more, that causes more climate change. Yeah. So is there an alternative way to stimulate growth and, or not stimulate growth? It's, it seems an <laughs> unfortunate connection that I was hearing from you, and maybe you could yeah. explain it differently. Yeah. If you could pass the, the, it along the row. Thank you. You want to take the question yes, now? Um, we were living in Asia, incredibly unequal society in Jakarta yeah. and Hong Kong and, and Shanghai. And then we spent seven years living in Stockholm uh, with a very different model. And now what we're back and inequality here is, is growing alarmingly. Um, it seemed so obvious in Stockholm that childcare was underpinning the, the equality, not just I'm talking about gender, I'm talking about financial e equality. Because when you're salary is only being reduced by 3% for the first child, 2% for the second child, 1% for the third child. Yeah. Yet when I left England, I was paying 100% of my salary to my childcare costs to look after my son, and I was working for free just to work. It, it just seems such an obvious economic argument. If you just do the sums, forget the morality, forget the equality, forget everything. Just look at the sums. Surely we need a childcare model that's going to support equality, equality and growth. I just, I'll let you into a secret. The, the tactic of taking three questions in one go <laughs> is an old politician's trick so they can avoid the one they don't want to answer. Right? I'm not going to let him do that. No, 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 we're gonna so answer, we're gonna AI, climate yeah. change, and childcare yeah. solve them all in two minutes. <laughs> so the, the, um, let me start with AI because this, this is really interesting. So um, there's, a, there's a great um, professor at Oxford Martin School, Carl Free who has run some extraordinary numbers about what the impact of AI and automation may be. But I kind of worked this out with the House of Commons Library about what it would mean for the average constituency in Britain. And automation, it turns out, over the next 10 years, could destroy more jobs in Britain than the shutdown of the coal industry and the steel industry put together. That's how big the impact could be. And so, unless we find a way of helping people build not just housing capital, not just pension capital, but human capital, unless we find a way of helping people train, retrain, and retrain for the future, then we are going to get a huge new pressure on inequality for the future. Because you know, what, what you've got now happening in the British economy is you've got a group of people who own assets. So the top 1% own about 70% of the wealth in Britain. That is multiplying year on year. So they will take their money from investment income. Investment income's doubled this century to about 80 billion. But the wages of those who are losing their jobs through automation, AI, continue to come under sustained downward pressure. So you've got these inequality pressures really about to become more and more acute. And we can see this risk now. And so unless we build you know, what I call universal basic capital, Unless we build these systems now for helping people counter these trends, we're going to be in, in real difficulty as a country um, over the years to come. So on, cli on climate, I mean, I think... Um, so, so by and large, what, what you see is that those, who, those amongst the super rich will actually save more of their money than spend it, but many of the things that they spend the money on are actually pretty bad for the planet. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a Rolls-Royce Phantom a uh, private jet, a super yacht, th th those are all pretty bad for the environment. And so, you know, we are, we are going to have to find a way of making your carbon footprint as socially unacceptable as drink driving. You know, and so, you know, there's a, there's a, one of the professors I interviewed is a woman called Brooke Harrington, who is a, a brilliant professor of economic anthropology um, at Dartmouth, um, who is actually, a, you know, reasonably a bit more confident than I am that you can begin to make some of these things culturally and socially unacceptable. Personally, I'm a little bit skeptical about that, and I think you are gonna need to start regulating and creating, I don't know how you do it, personal carbon budgets, I'm not quite sure. I don't get into some of those questions, but I can, I, I can see that, you, I, and I suspect that you're right, you're going to have to find a way of tackling this in a more robust way. And, and then on, on childcare, I mean, 
I, there's a couple of things on the revenue side of the equation that I don't really get into in the book. So I don't really get into rights at work, although that is a big part of how you support wages. If, if, if I was the chancellor in the next you know, parliament, which I'm not going to be, um, universal childcare is the single most important investment that we can make as a country. And you know, if I think, I, I represent the, one of the youngest constituencies in Britain. Um, over the years, what I've found is that the people who tend to know most fastest are, are primary school teachers. And so I visit a school every fortnight. And what I've found over the last two years, I always kind of ask, so what's, what's the new generation like coming in? Um, it's only now that head teachers are saying that generation of babies that was born just before or during COVID are now coming in with skills that are so poor and social, emotional um, issues that are now just off the scale. And in a constituency like mine, you know, we have about 25% of children coming into school with special educational needs. Frankly, and it, frankly, they are treated like second-class citizens. And so unless we can put in place universal childcare as early as possible, as they do in, so I've looked at Copenhagen, um, th we're not going to move the trend on this. It is, it is, I am absolutely convinced it is the single most important social investment that we can make as a country. Okay, let's take another round. You caught my attention. We know we're all flying. It's always the case, just so we're running out of time. Everybody wants to. Um, hi, thanks. Uh, Francesca. Um, sort of related to this question. Um, what I'm finding more and more is that for my generation, we are having to struggle to make the decision to have kids or not, because if you can't afford your home and you don't have a salary that's actually last, your living salary month to month on that. How are do you renting? Uh, no, I'm fortunate not, not to, but yeah. it's still to pay yeah. the mortgage or whatever, it's still living salary uh, yeah. month by month. But that does affect people, my generation, thinking about whether they have kids or not. How do you foresee that having an effect on our population going forward? Mm, okay, let's take a couple more. Yes, sir, right behind you. Um, have you thought about the sort of bringing the government and the private sector closer with government being kind of almost like a seed investor yeah. rather than a kind of a, a lender of last resort that's bailing out companies that are about to fail. Yeah. Could, would a sensible way of taxing but also stimulating growth be to invest in entrepreneurship but then taking a percentage of those companies and then the government then owns a significant amount of, you know, gets a lot back from that return on investment. Yeah, and then if you could side. pass it across, the gentleman there was so courteous in handing it to you, he could have stolen it for himself, <laughs> but he didn't. So I'll, I'm Thank going to you. reward you by uh, letting you ask the question. Thank you. My name is Srini. So this is an observation. Uh, with the new conservative party moving to the far right or closer to the far right, the new, new labor is moving to the space which has been vacated by the old conservative party on the spectrum, right? So mm. it, there's been a shift. I've not heard from Kia Stama anything that's bold or innovative or radical in terms of who he is or what he intends to do. And it seems to be a copy of the old conservative policies. Uh, and also, there seems to be an undue emphasis on taxing more and collecting more, but very little on what you intend to spend with or how you cut waste, especially uh, the, the, the money that we spend on nuclear submarines or, or on expeditions of war or whatever it is that we could potentially be saving um, and, and sort of using that money better. Yeah. I'm glad you're answering these questions. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got the great luxury of not being a Labour frontbencher. Um, so, you know, on, on, on the back bench you can provide the leader of the opposition or indeed the prime minister with all the advice you can uh, with all the advice you like and so you know this this is not a book that is you know deliberately designed to um provide the next manifesto it's a project for a three-term government and what i do think we have to do is we have to grow our economy faster we have to make sure that the fruits of that growth are more fairly shared but crucially, we've got to think now, this is what I'm so convinced about, we have to think beyond simply people's income, we have to think about people's wealth. When you've got a country where a quarter of people have got savings of less than £100, you've got a fragility and a vulnerability there now that, 
frankly, I can't remember in 20 years in politics. Amartya Sen, who was, a, you know, I think a big influence on, on both of us, um, once had a really vivid illustration of this. He said, poverty is tyranny. And right now, we have a tyranny of poverty now that is bending and twisting and perverting lives in a way that I've not seen in, in, in 20 years. And so if you do think that freedom requires security and security requires wealth, we've got to think not simply about how we improve people's income in the future, but how we think about how we improve people's wealth um, as well. Now, I, you know, I, I'm in the politics business. You know, we've ri I've written books because... I want to influence the debate, and I will continue to make that argument, and I hope some of those arguments will be um, influential. On, on, the, on the point about um, the entrepreneurial economy, 100%. If you're, um, you know, if you're, if you're building a, a national commonwealth fund, what that does allow you to do is to start seeding investments in um, all kinds of high-growth companies. And, you know, it's a tragedy that, you know, when we had North Sea oil in our country, we, we just basically frittered the money away in, in tax cuts, and, and that was like a sugar rush. It, once it was gone, it was gone. If we had saved that money, like the canny Norwegians, we would have a sovereign wealth fund today that would be worth 500 billion pounds. It would be enough to give every 25-year-old a 20,000 pound dividend each year. So, you know, what do we have going? We haven't got oil anymore. We have got clean energy, and we've definitely got intellectual property. So beginning to invest in a smart way now into some of these high-growth companies in the future is, is a good idea. Now, I would do this kind of regionally. I would be setting up regional investment banks rather than simply trying to do it centrally all the time. Um, but that is absolutely something that we've got to do because our investment function's broken in this country. Banks no longer lend to businesses. Um, only 4% of pension fund money goes into, UK, into the UK stock market. So that, so that investment money has got to kind of come from, come from somewhere. Um, and then on, on that sort of first question, you know, the, the, the truth is now that wealth inequality is so bad that people are taking life-changing decisions, like whether they can afford a family. And, and this is why, you know, I think there is an argument about freedom at the core of this, you know, there's a conservative argument about freedom that is well rehearsed. It's about the absence of constraint. But actually, I take a much more positive view of freedom. It is your agency, your options, your control over your life. That's, for me, what freedom really means. And you can't have freedom without security, and you can't have freedom without power. But security and power need wealth. And that's why I think if the left is going to win an argument about throwing back the frontiers of freedom in the 21st century, we've got to have an argument about how you build a wealth-owning democracy too. Let's have one more question. We're rapidly running out of time. I have, I've neglected the back, so I will go right to the back there, the gentleman at the back, with my apologies to everyone who couldn't get in. But there is another way of asking a question, which is to queue up to buy a book from Liam, right. and, then, <laughs> and then you can ask him a question as he's signing your book. Yes, Hi, sir. my name's Anna from the Equal Access Line. Um, so how much do you also think access to financial products and services is an issue? Because we um, have been lending to refugees in the UK who have been locked out of access to any financial products since 2017 with incredible repayment rates, but those people still remain unable to access mainstream financial services, and we're now looking at opening that out, so we offer interest-free lending, and what we need is to then to be able to integrate people into financial services. But they're still locked out, so how much do you think access to financial products and working with kind of banking institutions is needed as a change. Great question. Liam, over Do you to want you. To that? So I think it's a huge issue. And again, one of the, the core of this idea of universal basic capital is, is universal access to the financial services system. And again, I mean, it sounds bold, sounds radical, but actually the National Endowment and Savings Trust, which is the, the organization that runs auto-enrollment pensions have just finished a four-year pilot of what are called um, sidecar accounts. So basically, if you've got an auto-enrollment account for your pension, you automatically get a kind of a savings account opened on your behalf. Over four years, it's transformed savings rates. So almost, I think, 93% of people keep the accounts open. It accumulates savings of nearly 400 quid. 
And remember, when you've got a quarter of people in this country with savings of less than £100, this is game-changing. So the idea of making sure that actually everybody gets a universal savings account um, when you know, they start work um, or come into the country, start accessing the benefit system, is something that would transform access to the financial services system and begin to give people access to lower costs and better returns. Right now, the people who enjoy the highest returns on their savings are those who are richest. In fact, the relationship between risk and return is, is now broken down. It's more about how much you've got that drives your level of, of return. So if you want to democratise access to the best savings, you've got to democratise access to the financial services system. And that was a really important part of James's Mead's insights that have got a bit lost. Liam, one last question from me before we, we close. Um, I think you can say that in America you saw the consequences with the Trump presidency of neglecting these questions. Yeah. You know, it turned up in their politics. If we in this country neglect these questions and we don't take your diagnosis seriously and we, we drift on, what would be the consequences of ignoring the inequalities of wealth? So this... So, so, uh, so, we now, so we now know that for voters whose wealth does not keep track with the national average, they are much more likely to vote for populists, whether that's Brexit Party, whether it's Le Pen, far right in Scandinavia, Trump. So, so the risk is that if we don't start addressing the, the inequality of poverty today, you will see a populist right in this country that is even stronger in the future. And the truth is the opposite of populism is separatism. Because in a country like ours, you will begin to get people who are looking at populists in, say, power in Westminster and saying, well, do you know what? I no longer want to be part of that. And you're beginning to see that pressure now in America. So, you know, when I was at business school 20 years ago, we used to, like, read case studies about whether China could hold together now, literally, people are writing books about whether America can hold together. So, you know, wealth inequality creates a resentment that is so strong, it can melt the joints that hold nations together. And that surely is a politics that we can't wish upon our children. On that happy note... <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming. Please join me in thanking for a brilliant <laughs> evening, Liam Bird.